Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and very good evening to everyone on this wonderful biotechnology uh, discussion with Mr. Nadav Kidron, the CEO of RMED Pharmaceuticals. Welcome, Nadav. Welcome to another session of biotechnology. Thank you, Prabhu. Always good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a, a long time since we had you again, but I'm hoping that we have a fantastic conversation today and looking forward to that. And to all the attendees, thank you so much for your time. We are very, very grateful. And uh, we're delighted to have Mr. Kidron with us. And I'll quickly uh, introduce Nadav uh, Kidron for all of us. Mr. Nadav Kidron co-founded Oramed in 2006. He's an entrepreneur whose experience includes senior executive roles in wide range of industries. He co-founded Enterabio as a joint venture uh, formed by Oramed and DNA Biomedical Solutions. He's a member of the Israel Technology Innovation Board and an international lecturer in Israel's entrepreneurial culture in the country's roots as an oasis uh, of innovative ideas. He holds a bachelor's degree in law and an international master's in business administration, both from the Bar Ilan University in Israel. Mr. Kidron is a fellow of the Mirage Business Executive Leadership Program and a member of the Israeli Bar Association. With that, a very, very warm welcome to you, Nadav. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Nadav, uh, is it possible that you could increase your mic? I'm, I, I'm having a slight uh, problem in perhaps listening to it. I, I hope it's just not an internet issue. <clears throat> So Nadav, I mean, going back to our previous uh, discussions that we had uh, in November, 2020, it was the peak time of COVID and the world had sort of shut down and we had our discussion about 16 months ago. I believe our audience, many of them are repeat, they have been very interested, they come back and they want to hear you, would be interested in hearing about the progress that Automed had made about its, we'll start with its flagship product, oral insulin that time uh, versus the last 16 months. If you could sort of rewind for us and perhaps get us to relieve those very interesting moments that have been there. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, please. Okay, excellent. So maybe just as a reminder for those who are not familiar with Oramid, what we have is a platform technology that allows us to take peptides and deliver them orally. Our flagship product is oral insulin. And the idea, and again, I think it's important to know the idea behind the oral insulin is that when we give it orally, it goes first pass into the liver. And we want to take advantage of the first pass to the liver and basically signal to the liver and stop the excessive production of glucose by the liver. So patients type two earlier on will be able to take a pill at nighttime and therefore their fasting blood glucose will be reduced and the overall glucose levels are going to be reduced in the most physiological way without paying the price of side effects. And that's why this is something that is extremely of interest uh, as I'm sure we're gonna touch upon later on. So the biggest thing that happened since we spoke last is that we announced that we got the last patient randomized in a phase three trial. So. We have two phase threes that are going on in parallel. The first one and the larger one, we have randomized 710 patients. And that means that from this point, we are counting down six months and then we're going to get the data. So by the end of the year, we will announce the data early January. We're going to share data from the first phase three in the United States under the FDA on oral insulin. Wonderful. I think that's, that's amazing. And while you are carrying out these uh, trials in the US, are there any other geographies that you are thinking of? I mean, if you can discuss or if there's an opportunity for you to let us know as to what are the geographies. We understand that these are taking place in the United States, but are there any further geographies that you're thinking of? So uh, the first phase three is taking entirely place in the United States. The second phase three, which we're undergoing right now, is taking place in the United States, Europe, and Israel. 
Besides that, we have discussions with potential partners in other countries that uh, want to explore the possibility of an accelerated phase three. You have to remember that, unfortunately, diabetes is prevalent all over the world. So some places we have higher percentage, such as uh, uh, countries in the Middle East. Some countries, maybe it's a little bit better, but there is no place around the world that the type two diabetes, it's not something which is the first or the second most important thing that we have to deal with as far as a society when we want to talk about the medical issues that we have in the society. And Nadav, for the sake of uh, many people who have joined uh, now or maybe joining for the first time, would it be possible for you to sort of just roll back to the data that you got in phase two and what made the world so excited about the Aromed technology? I think that would be also a good reflection 16 months on. When we have someone who is a type 2 diabetic, the most important thing that we want to do is we want to lower the glucose level. We want to lower the hemoglobin A1C to keep it within a reasonable range. And we have a, a toolbox that with different things that we can use in order to, to, go those, to get those levels down. Each tool has an advantages and disadvantages. Many times the disadvantages are side effects, compliance because it's inconvenient to take. So for example, if you look at an insulin injection, you have an issue of compliance because people don't like to take injections. You have an issue of hypoglycemias that you get with the injection. You have an issue of gaining weight that you have with the insulin injection. When we talk about oral insulin, and this is what we saw in the results of the phase 2B, which was done on 300 patients and took entirely place in the United States, what we're able to see is, number one, there's literally no serious side effects, meaning someone can take the oral insulin and there's no worry about any side effect. And by the way, the reason for that is also because of the first pass to the liver. So the liver can take the insulin and we don't get the hypoglycemia and other stuff that we see with the injection. So number one, oral insulin is safe. That's a huge thing. Number two, we saw a very meaningful reduction in the sugar level, in the A1C levels of those patients that took it. So if you're talking about patients that started with the high level of A1C, we saw over 1% reduction in their A1C without side effect and in a very physiological way, which means that there is a product here that can be given to potentially those tens of millions of people and in a safe way and in a physiological way can help them control their diabetes in a new way that was never possible before the oral insulin. I think uh, this was something which was absolutely amazing is the fact that you got a reduction of more, close or more than 1% of HbO1c, I think that's phenomenal. I think that's, that's what will capture everybody's imagination. And that's uh, fantastic. Moving on, Nadav, I mean, one of the things which I remember you a couple of months telling me that Aramed and you had undertaken a study in the US to see compliance of a syringe versus oral. And there has been some very interesting discussions between doctors and patients, caregivers that you all found out. That, I think, would be a very, this is the time to sort of bring that out. And I would love for you to sort of highlight it for us here. You know, obviously, it makes sense for all of us that oral insulin is a product that everybody would want to use. But everybody is also, when it's concerning their own company, you want to make sure that you see things right. And we want to make sure that we understand how much of a demand there is going to be for the oral insulin. So what we did is we hired Acovia, which is, probably one of the top research firms. And they went and interviewed doctors in the United States, in Europe and other places. And then we got the data out of it in order for Acovia to put together a forecast sheet that will allow us to know how much quantities we're going to need over the next few years. Because don't forget, we already have to start thinking about scaling up the production in order to meet the demand, which is coming right after the approval. So um, as much as we thought that this product is going to have a huge demand, we were so pleasantly, I don't want to say surprised, but pleasantly received 
the data that came from those uh, well done interviews by Akubia. And what we saw is that basically almost every doctor said that they have a high probability of a very good probability that they're going to administer this oral insulin. And we use the same profile that we got on our phase 2B. This is the drug. We use this, they, they're going to subscribe, though, they're going to give those oral insulin to their patients, which means that there's a real need for it. The doctors are interested, they're looking forward for, to it. And as long as the phase 3 will, will give us the same results as the phase 2B, which, again, I, I would hope so. I don't see any reason why not, but we have to wait and see for sure then I think we've got a product that can be a real game changer in the way we treat diabetes today. Absolutely. That brings me to this point. Now that, you know, you've been, this trial has been going on for a couple of years now, more than eight, 10 years that we've been knowing, knowing each other. What is the runway now for oral insulin? What happens from now, say for the next couple of years? When could people really see this in the market, say in the US, uh, where do you think you'll be able to look for the approvals? So what is the, uh, in essence, the runway now for oral insulin? So the biggest thing that's going to happen is actually the results that we're going to get and share in early January. And the reason is because then we know it's safe. We know how well it worked. We know exactly why will be the demand in the market. And from there, it's actually just going through the motions until we get the approval and start marketing and sales. But in practicality, what's going to happen is that after we're going to get the results of the first phase one, we're going to wait to get the result of the second phase, sorry, phase three. We're going to wait to get the results of the second phase three. And then what we're going to do is we're going to submit the BLA application to the FDA in order for the FDA to approve the, uh, the marketing of the oral insulin. Now, we're already in touch back and forth with the FDA. We know what's going to happen. So we're talking about a process of a year and a half. So by the end of 24, beginning of 25, depending when exactly we're going to finish the second phase three, we should be getting the approval in the United States for start to marketing the oral insulin. And in other countries, it can potentially be even sooner, depending on, on the specifics in those specific countries. That's very exciting. So you, what you're saying is maybe around early 2025 is when people could look forward to seeing this uh, being announced as coming out commercially. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, now, um, I see a lot more people have joined in. So welcome again. And please, we have a chat box here. So you could directly put your questions uh, for Mr. Nadav Kidron uh, that we would then put it to him in, at the end of the discussion. We wish to have a very good, healthy question answer session after this. Apart from, uh, now moving on from oral insulin, why this is a great thing. I, I wish to ask you a very different sort of question, Nadav. With the recent stock meltdown, if I can use, or the downturn that has happened, there's a pretty much of a bloodbath that we see on NASDAQ and many other stock exchanges in the US and globally. How is the situation impacting? I mean, every company has been impacted that's been listed. We know that. How is it uh, impacted RMR and how are you handling it? And uh, what are the things that you're looking at? So in general, what we all saw is that one day suddenly everything changes. And from being in, I like to call like the seven good years suddenly changed and, and we may be getting into harder years. And that means that the ability to raise money is becoming much more challenging. And uh, unfortunately, many companies that do not have enough money to raise money, they'll have to give away much more. And some of them are not gonna be able to, to raise the fund needed. We were very uh, blessed that in Oramed specifically, um, we took advantage and, and we did raise money at, uh, at the market when the market was still in good conditions. And therefore Oramed, according to the last report, we have about $174 million in cash. So Oramed has the sufficient cash to move forward to get the oral insulin and the rest of the programs forward without a need uh, to raise and dilute additionally at these difficult times. Well, that's, that's very good. And that brings me to this next thing is, as you know, the pharmaceutical world is a brutal world. Either it works or it doesn't work. And once the first thing works, then you become like, you know, that what's next, what's next? So I will also place that question to you is, what, apart from oral insulin, 
what other products are you looking at uh, in diet in sort of moving forward for diabetes that you're focused on? Okay, so we have a few products in diabetes, such as the oral insulin for diabetes. We're also working on oral insulin for NASH. So we can have results in the next quarter uh, from a phase two from oral insulin on NASH. Um, we're also working on GLP-1 analog. And then we have some explanatory programs that we're working on other fields. But you have to remember, this is a platform technology that has been proven to be able to take peptides and deliver them orally. We also have, and we're going to elaborate on that, but we took that technology into Oravax together with Primas in order to, to get into the world of vaccines. And, and, and I'll be happy to elaborate on that world as well. Absolutely. I think that is something I was going to come next. And that is an absolutely amazing venture that we have started. And for the, I think uh, more than me, I think Natav, you should elaborate to everyone and I would be happy to chime in a little that how Auravax was initiated and how it came all about. So I give it to you and if possible, I will also chime in a little. Okay, so just, just for those who are not familiar, the idea beyond Auravax and Primas coming together and, and the newborn was basically Auravax, oral vaccines, is that the VLP technology that was developed by Primas will allow us a very relatively uh, inexpensive scaling up of the VLP technology. And a VLP advantage is that they use three antigens that specifically everybody is familiar with the COVID. It will allow us to potentially have a one shot or maybe even if we divide the shot into two times that will be good against all the variants because you don't only have the S spike which very easily can be mutated but you also have the E and the N. And, and that's why that by itself is a huge deal. Now, put together that with the Oramets technology, you're talking about an oral vaccine. And then suddenly we don't have as much as side effect. We're having much higher level of compliance. We don't have the issue of the waste that we see with the injectables, you know, the billions of syringes and, and, and everything that comes with it. And suddenly we look into a new generation of vaccine that is about to come. Absolute Nadav. And this is where uh, I, I must inform all our attendees here that what an amazing thing it was to work along with Nadav and to see how he really works in setting up a company and the mechanics of it, uh, getting both the platforms to fuse. And as uh, he said, that we are now in getting into phase one or rather in phase one in South Africa and uh, going uh, full guns ahead with it. I think it's very, very exciting. Maybe I just mentioned, I see we got a question about the status of, uh, of Oravax. So maybe just to elaborate on that. So we said we'll put a full report at the, uh, at the end of the quarter, at the end of June, with the exact numbers. In South Africa, the trial has been going slowly because of the high rate of failure, because many people who think they don't have COVID, they do have COVID. And therefore, what we're doing is we're switching the focus into the booster. And we'll elaborate on that at the end of June. So we're going to get data from, from those naive subjects, but we're also going to move more and more into the booster because you have to remember, just on COVID alone, okay, people think, okay, I can fly now, no mask, COVID is over. As of today, every day, 7 million COVID shots are being administered every day. So, so the market is still there. But, and I think this is a very important but, when we think about Oravax, we think about two things. Number one is a platform company that can take vaccines and deliver them orally. So we started with COVID and we're working on bringing on more vaccines and the advantage of using the Oramets technology will allow us to take those vaccines orally, which is a huge thing. But second thing, and I know it sounds a little bit long-term thinking and I think we are allowed to think long-term even in today's world. Right now we have SARS-1, SARS-2. There's no question there's gonna be another round of this SARS variation one way or another. By having a company with the technology out there and the ability to produce and to scale up, it means that when the next COVID is gonna come, and I don't know if it's gonna be in three years, in five years, in eight years, but we all know it will come. We wanna make sure that we have a platform technology company that is there, will be able to react fast to produce the vaccines, to produce it, to scale it up on a commercial level and to be able to sell it to different countries. And this is what we're doing now. We, we, we're setting the seeds 
also for the future besides the work that we do on the present. Absolutely, I think that is uh, amazing to hear. I would also like you to elaborate a little if you could um, sort of, um, I know you've touched upon this, uh, but there are certain places that have already started discussing because I do see one of the questions also that what are you doing apart from the trials? There are uh, sort of potential collaborators in Mexico and Vietnam who are already shown a lot of interest. So if you could just maybe highlight one or two points because I do see one or two questions come up on that is what have been those discussions like? What are the what are the issues that they have highlighted as collaborators, not as regulators, but as collaborators and people who may want to license this from Aravax? What have been those discussions like, Madam? So uh, in in Mexico, we have a joint venture with Genoma Lab, which is one of the largest companies in Mexico. And um, we're working on them on the booster program. And again, we'll update all of that uh, at the end of the month. I have to be careful, it's a public company, so I don't want to spill information here right. uh, before we made it uh, publicly available. The other side of the world, the Pen Pharma in Vietnam, they already committed themselves and pre-ordered 10 million um, oral COVID-19 vaccine. And the idea is that they wanna make sure that they will be able to supply Vietnam and potentially other countries with this uh, oral COVID-19 vaccine. Fantastic, Nadar. Look, I see a, a number of questions that have come up and I think you uh, answered a few of them already. Uh, do you believe, and there is one more question which I might take right now before I switch gears, is they said that you are going to try it in both South Africa and Israel. Uh, I think uh, that's one question which come up. Uh, do you foresee a trial coming up in Israel is the question that uh, we have one of the whole attendees have asked. So what we've seen from our experience in South Africa is that uh, the real need is for the booster. And the amount of effort you're gonna put and the reward you're gonna get from the booster versus giving it at the first line, you know, we're working in a very tight timeline because reality changes, you know? If we were a year ago or two years ago, we're gonna be in a very different place where we are today. So uh, what we're doing, we're doing the adjustment. Unfortunately, in our world, you cannot turn around things in a second because it's not up to you. You have to write a new protocol and you have to submit the protocol and they have to review it and you have to get the approvals and all of that. So this is part of the turn we're taking now into the booster strategy. So we will get the results from South Africa, but everything else, Mexico, Israel, everything else, we, we under the process uh, to, to move into the booster and, and we see that the big market is over there. And again, because of the advantage that this oral COVID-19 vaccine can be one shot, actually one pill, that will be good against all the variants. It will be a great booster if someone took the Pfizer or Moderna or whatever it is, J&J, &J, they'll be able to pop up this uh, COVID oral 19 vaccine and uh, they're gonna be safe uh, moving forward. Fantastic. Few of the questions I will try and summarize in my next question. Uh, Aramed has opened up the oral delivery of therapeutics and vaccines wide open. We have uh, maybe a couple of examples on the therapeutic side. We have COVID on the vaccine side, and we know that there's going to be a pipeline coming soon. So what do you think? I mean, this is again a hypothetical question, but I, one of the question, uh, attendees has asked is this, what would be the next sort of generation of drugs and vaccines do you think coming up? What do you foresee happening in this space? Just not particularly uh, relevant to only Aramid, but what do you see happening in this space? Well, if I can say something which is not so popular, um... Okay, I'm, nobody can stone me here. I'm in a protected area. <laughs> I'm not sure that the mRNA is the answer to all the vaccine issue. I think the mRNA has been very popular now. Going forward, I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of unknown, a lot of stuff we need to wait and see. Yep. And I'm not going to be surprised if we're going to go back to the, I don't want to sell the all good stuff, but I, I really think that there's two things that are happening here. Um, COVID has created something which basically is very new in the medical world. For the first time in a very long history, there's suddenly mistrust between the health world and the people. 
And even if you look at the people who do not want to get vaccinated, it's not one or 2% of the population. You're talking about a very meaningful group of people. And there's a real mistrust between the authorities, the health authorities, and the people. And that's something that I'm afraid will create a big problem. And it will put a much bigger weight on the pharmaceuticals and the health authorities in order to make sure that what they deliver to the market, they can also communicate and make sure and they have to convince the people and the doctors that this is something which is safe and relevant. And that's why I believe that specifically with the vaccine and in general, the whole overall world is actually something that will have a huge advantage because this is something very important to explain. When you take something orally versus an injection, it's a much safer route because you're taking advantage of the body's ability to protect those things that are coming into the body. When you go into an injection directly into the bloodstream, that's it, you got it into the bloodstream. So I think that two things are gonna push the oral world much more forward. Number one is that ability to get stuff in a safer way. And number two, we're getting spoiled. And the idea of higher compliance is something that's gonna be very attractive. And that's why both with Oravax and Oramed and potential other things that we're going to do, we feel that this is our time to shine through this oral delivery platform. And the data that we're gonna get in January is gonna confirm, you know, uh, in a higher level than ever before, that this is it, it's here, it's working, it's safe, and therefore many other things can be utilized with it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nadav. I think uh, you've really given very good insight into this. Now switching gears again to another topic that's a personal favorite of mine and of great interest, and I'll come back to some of the questions that are popping up here, is that whenever I visit Israel, and I've been watching on LinkedIn and others, is that Israel has suddenly become an innovation think tank for seeing in food and alternate proteins. We are now seeing companies come up like whey milk, amai proteins, you know, sweetener, this and that, artificial milk. I just wanted to pick your mind and allow our attendees, I'm sure some of them are very knowledgeable protein people, but I would like your view as well, especially from the height and some of the organizational views that you have from both the government side and the private industry in Israel, as to where do you think this is going? And if you could uh, give us a bird's eye view of that. So, as you mentioned, Prabhupada, I'm sitting on the board of the umbrella organization of biotechnology and high tech in Israel, and I'm being exposed to a lot of what's going on there. So for those of you who are not familiar or not familiar enough, I personally, I want to invite you to come and visit Israel because the innovation that's coming out of, out of Israel, not only in the food world, in the high tech, cyber, biotechnology, medical device is really unbelievable. And, and you should really come and see it in your own eyes. Go and see the, the whole archeological site on the one hand, but go and see the future on the other hand of all these developments. And those of you who are outside of Israel, I highly recommend to, to look and to source and, and, and to do business with Israeli companies because the, the innovation is, is really unbelievable. Specifically about the food tech, um, I think we have some real huge game changers that are coming out of Israel. One, one familiar example is a company called Remilk, but they actually taking the cell out of the milk and they're able to produce, you know, a recombinant milk, but it's not made from the cow. And it will have all the advantages without the disadvantages. So what that means is that we're probably gonna get to a world within a few years that is going to be a dairy free world. They're at the point that they're putting a huge facility in Denmark now to produce. They already started sales. And again, I'm not a prophet, but I think we're moving into a world that both with the meat and the milk are not going to be animal derived. And I think especially in India, it's going to be appreciated. But also on the Jewish side, I think can tell you there's a lot of advantages to having food which is not animal made. So I think those technologies are going to take us into a new world. And it's going to be a better world than what we've known before. Oh, this is uh, this is just amazing. I mean, looking at some of the things that they have been putting out, it's just amazing uh, uh, to see what kind of things can come out. So, how did Israel and the entire ecosystem? Because it didn't start yesterday; it started a few years ago. 
I would like you to throw light on how did the funding come about? How was this whole thing put together? Where did this risk capital come? Was it a lot coming from the academic side, the ideas? If you could throw light on this sort of ecosystem that, I mean, it's hundreds and millions of dollars. There's a few billion dollars that are being put at stake. So how did this whole thing come together and play about? Well, actually, if you look at last year, last year alone, about $25 billion were invested in the, what we call the innovation community in Israel. And, and for those of you who are not familiar, you know, I like to joke that between um, India, China, and Israel, we make a third of the world. Um, but it's a joke because Israel is actually a very, very small country. And, um, and it's really amazing to see how much is coming out of it. But it's exactly, Prabhuda, like you said, it's an ecosystem. And you want to make sure that you have, number one, is the people who can innovate and can think and can come up with the ideas and execute them. And then obviously you need the funding and you need the leadership. And what happened in the last few years, because of many success stories, there's more funding, uh, there's more talent, but there's still a huge, huge, huge shortage of talent in Israel. And um, I, I can tell you that today, especially in the high tech world, to get people, good qualified people is becoming very hard. The joke was, it used to be when you come for an interview, they tell you, don't call us, we'll call you. Today, the person who comes to the company tells the company, don't call us, I'll call you because of such a high demand and because that there is still, even in these difficult days, there's still so much money that's looking for, for real breakthrough technologies that are being developed there. And last but not the least, I would like to say, since you bought this India... Israel, there's been a lot of uh, very healthy exchange in the last couple of years between Israel and India. And how do you see this synergy going forward, especially in the health and med tech area? We know that in defense, there is a lot of collaboration and cooperation. However, how do you see this in the med tech and the health tech area? So I think, you know, in order for a good collaboration to happen, you need to think, you need high up there, you need the governments to, to open the doors. And I think between Prime Minister Moody and it started with the Prime Minister Netanyahu, there was a very strong connection that opened the door on that sense. And then specifically with the companies, I believe that there's still unrealized potential between India and Israel. Just as an example, right? I spoke a minute ago about the shortage of, of, of good talent. You know, in today's world, you can actually source a lot of good talent from India. Someone can be sitting in India and can work for a high-tech company in Israel, and both of them will benefit out of it. Uh, between agriculture, um, armies, technologies, and a lot of the other stuff, um, I think we, we're seeing a huge collaboration, but I think it's just the beginning. And I really encourage both my friends on the Israeli side and on the Indian side to try and explore how more can be achieved. And I have no doubt that we're going to see the numbers and the number of collaborations going up as the years come through. No, no, that, thank you so much. And as we wind down our discussions, I must admit and tell the attendees, I've seen how we've known each other now for over nine, and this is our 10th year of getting to know each other as uh, professionals, as well as becoming good friends. And I've seen how you have very steadily taken your company ahead. It's been Amazing to see it, been part of a, a lot of that growth story, but been absolutely lovely to have you again. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And before we go off, I mean, there are a couple of questions that have come up. So please, uh, I will take you through that. And then we would look forward to a sort of a sum up from you. Uh, so Nadab, if it's okay with you, maybe we could uh, just get into one of the quick questions that have uh, sort of come in. Um, so, yeah, I see one question, Prabhu, that, that maybe you can answer, the difference between uh, oral vaccine to inhaled vaccines. Uh, maybe I, I was going to take that a little later, but yes, I can take that now. Is uh, Both the oral and the inhaled nasal vaccines will have, in many ways, a similar uh, sort of mechanical action. They are both going to tickle the mucosal. But what you have to understand is when we ingest something, and take it up orally, it will, and it gets absorbed in the small intestine, there's a very healthy immune system out there. Of course, if when you inhale it, it, for certain viruses, it may be slightly having a more advantageous effect. We will need to prove it. But what we have learned, uh, because the last couple of months and maybe a year, we've been speaking to a lot of immunologists being part of Oravax, 
uh, they're very excited in seeing things given orally. It's much easier. It's much more systemic. You get a very potent mucosal response along with also a very uh, good IgG response. So there has been, it gives you a dual uh, operational on the humoral side, as well as uh, what we are trying to now figure out and see how the rest of the immune system goes. So it's still early days, but very exciting days. Uh, Nadav, there was a question that came is, does, uh, have you seen any adverse effects? I know you've already said it, but just as a question I've come, on systemic toxicity to the oral insulin or any of its components? This is, this is something that we feel very strongly about. You know, we have to wait to unblight the data from the phase three, but I can tell you that this drug oral insulin is very, very, very safe. Thank you. Uh, so there was a question from a person who I do know very well and I know for many 20 odd years, he's asked, what does the liver do to the oral insulin it receives? Okay, so I think this is the most important thing about the oral insulin. Many people don't understand that, uh, but I think if you want to know why Oramed is so interesting, it's because of the first delivery to the liver. Because what happens is that the liver is the organ that regulates the secretion of glucose and insulin into the body. And how does it know how much to put from each one? So they're like a signaling system. So when the pancreas produces insulin and it sends it into the liver, the liver gets insulin. That means that there's too much glucose in the blood and it shuts off the production of glucose in the liver. By us giving a small amount of insulin into the liver, we are signaling to the liver that there's too much glucose and we're able to shut off the production of glucose from the source. So unlike treating an accumulation of glucose in the bloodstream, by getting a little bit of insulin into the liver, we're able to, to really um, deal with the glucose in the most physiological way possible. And without people gaining weight, without the issue of insulin toxicity. And that's why we believe that oral insulin is a real game changer for the world of diabetes. Thank you very much, Nadav. There's also a, another question, which I, um, I'll still ask you, but I don't know how you would like to answer it is, what is the molecular size? Or do you think that you have explored the entire breadth of the size of a drug that the Oramed technology would perhaps ask, uh, work on? So we, we went to the size of, um, of um, insulin. Obviously, if you look at growth hormone, which is three times the size of insulin, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but there are so many potential candidates that are around the size or smaller than insulin that could be good candidates but we really are working very diligently in order to make sure that we get the right candidates in the fastest way to the market and work on them as well. Thank you. And now you can also chime in a little on this is uh, the Oramax uh, formulation uses the uh, Oramet technology and the VLP is very large. It's about 190 nanometer particle size. So that gives you it's in me mega data. So we're not talking of kilo data. So that's also another thing that uh, would give you an opportunity. Now, moving on, I, um, the, uh, I think we've gone through this, most of it in a sense, this, yeah, okay. So there's a question, diabetes is increasing in children. Is there a thought that you would like to uh, dwell on that, Nadal? I'll just say children, we're talking about type one. Our current trial is on type two, but there's no question and we've showed it in previous trial that oral insulin is very beneficial for type one as well. We're gonna progress, progressing with that, but um, you know, it's, it's a smaller market and a very important market, but uh, the biggest data is gonna come is only for type two. Thank you, Nata. Thank you so much. Um, this is another question that's come in is, uh, Will China remain an attractive market for healthcare investing, supporting uh, the emergence of Chinese biotech and health techs? Uh, what is your, I, you may wish to answer this question or? So maybe I'll just start, I think on the geopolitical level, I think China is, is moving into the direction of being more isolated than before and, and less open to, to the West. So, so I think we actually gonna see a little bit of a deterioration as far as their 
things that are going on between uh, China and the West. Being that said, you still have over a billion and a half people there and it's still the second largest economy. So, so there are going to be ways to collaborate, but it's just going to be a little bit more challenging than before. Yes, please. I think um, uh, that's about the questions, I guess, uh, uh, we have right now. And uh, we are now running a slightly over time on this from Nadal. With that, I would invite you for some of your uh, comments and sum up comments on this, please. And then I'll provide mine. And first of all, thank you, Prabhuda, for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody who joined us to listen. If you are interested, I would highly recommend to get connected to us, not only on the website, you can get an email updates with the big news, but something like today, Today Talk, we have it on the social media. So LinkedIn, if you get connected to us, so you can really stay up to date because the next few months are going to be very, very interesting as far as Oramed. It's going to be the NASH results. We're going to have another mechanism of action trial and we're going to get results for the oral insulin. We're going to share all the updates on the, on the COVID-19 the oral and obviously, the biggest thing is the beginning of January, we're going to get the phase three oral insulin results. So, so anybody who's interested, please stay tuned and, and keep in touch. And thank you, Prabhuda, for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen to this. Nadav, first, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are. It's always a pleasure to have you on a chat with us. Uh, we have a lot of people here, a lot of more questions coming in, but I think we would email that separately to you and maybe get back to you again. I, I really enjoy uh, this session with you. Thank you so much. Absolute, a lot of congratulations to Aramed and with the next venture that we have together, Aramax, uh, we look forward to changing some of the landscapes. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Prabhuda. Looking forward to working together for many more successful years. Thank you so much, Nadal. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank and thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure having all of you on this uh, call with us. Uh, we will have the, uh, the video up on YouTube. We will put it up on LinkedIn as well. You'll find many of the links there. And thank you once again. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.